Hi, this is Mike. Get your Bibles ready. I want to do a study, three or four lessons on shepherding. Shepherding. A lot of people don't like that, especially Americans. They don't like it at all. I'm going to talk about the good and the bad, and in between, the ugly, what you should do with it, what I've learned over 40 years about shepherding. Uh, they may call it by a thousand different names, but it's still shepherding. Submitting to one another and submitting yourself underneath somebody that's been anointed and appointed. Uh, sometimes we don't like that. And we don't like the way people shepherd or whatever you want to call it. It is called shepherding. But I notice that there's a stigma with it, that's for sure. And over the years, I've heard so many bad things about the shepherding movement and this and that and this and that. But if you really get down to the thick of things, they'll, they'll ask you, are you submitted to a pastor? Are you submitted under the brethren? Do you submit to your husband? Do you submit here or submit here? Do you submit to one another? You know, the whole idea of submission, what it means, where it's going, what we're supposed to do with it. I've noticed that people don't mind submitting to Jesus too much. He's the chief shepherd. But they do have a problem submitting to people, humans. <laughs> they're flawed. Humans, some of them aren't too smart. But that doesn't mean they're not anointed. And God has anointed them. He doesn't anoint smarts. I wish he did, but he doesn't. He anoints people. The calling and election of God are without repentance. I mean, he, he just anoints them. I found out that the hard way many times. Scrapping with the anointed. Fighting with the, I've been fist fighting with the anointed before. I got sick late at night and wondered why. <laughs> That's the Lord. I'm not supposed to have no sickness. By Jesus stripes I'm healed and I walk in divine health. I pushed the word hard in my life. And he sent his word to heal me. And I just sat and believed and wouldn't shut up. I finally just shut up and said, All right, Lord, what is this? And he said, You hit your brother. I, I punched him out in church hard. I hit this guy so hard, it sounded like a 45 gun going off. Pow! Knocked him right out in front of everybody. Well, I said, He's not your anointed. And the Lord said to me, Oh, he's my anointed. And I don't like you fighting the anointing with the anointing. You hit him. I said, I, I did. I don't hardly repent of it, but I do repent of hitting your anointed. I'm sorry for touching your anointed. I said, okay, now the sickness and disease could leave me. I didn't feel well. I feel like throwing up. It's horrible. And he said, I didn't let the devil in on you. You get him off you. You've been given the power. Now you're free, clear, clean. Get him off you. So I bound him up in the name of Jesus and told that sickness to leave me. <laughs> like, like some kind of power guy. And it felt like a cellophane was ripped off my body. Plastic was just ripped off my body and sickness and disease went with it. I learned a good lesson about the anointed, about who's chosen, about submission that night. That was 35 years ago, if not more. Father, we ask you to give us wisdom and understanding concerning this subject. It's a roughie. This subject can be hard. We ask in Jesus' name that you show us, give us, please, sir. Your words not hidden, that it should stay hidden forever. You hid it for your children and those that are looking for you. You're a God of the whole world. You're not the God of the church only. You're God of the Jews and Gentiles and Christians. You're the God of everybody. And you want them to come into the fold. You want them to come into the Christian experience, the Dispensation of grace, I ask in Jesus' name that you show us now. Amen and amen. <laughs> Get your Bible ready and hopefully... These these studies, I, I don't mean they'll be too long, but they have a lot of information in them. We're going to be talking about shepherding. What What is shepherding? Very simply. A shepherd is one who feeds and, and cares for sheep. My grandfather was a shepherd and I watched that. And he was also a rancher, both. A shepherd who feeds and and cares for his sheep. I went with my grandfather when I was four, and he was 72, I think, somewhere around that. Maybe a little older. And we went on horseback around 
in the LaSalle Mountains in Utah, mentalist house. And we went to three different camps on horseback, and I would sit in front. I remember clearly. And we'd go from sheep herding station to sheep herding station. They had a little wagon pulled up there to each one of them, and we'd check the sheep. And the pasture is their good food, move them around the mountain. And he'd take all day, and he asked my mother if I could go with him. And she'd let me go. And I'd go with him on horseback. We'd check out those sheep. He was a good shepherd. I watched him do things to sheep and with sheep. He always take care of them, all of them, every one of them. He knew his business. He was a shepherd. Shepherding is introduced early in the Bible, for we read about Abel, Adam's son Abel in Genesis 4:2, and it simply says of him he was he was a keeper of the, the sheep, the flock, the sheep. So Abel's the first shepherd, really, literal shepherd, referred to in the Bible. The literal meaning is quite clear in both the Old and New Testament in the New Testament as well, but if the Hebrew word and the Greek, rea, pointing in the Greek word, they both mean a herdsman or a shepherd. Now, you wondered how there could be a lot of trouble over something so simple, which just has been, I suppose, is, is in the lamb which we interpret it and the way we interpret it. In its metaphorical form, it's not too much, but bringing it into the the word, the scriptures. Let's look at let's look in the origin of the word in classical literature first. The literal meaning, of course, is clear in classical literature. A shepherd is one who cares for the literal sheep. That definition is nothing is never in question. It's when we come into the metaphorical uses of the word shepherd that we start to have some problems. That people don't like it. Homer and Plato both refer to a a shepherd in the metaphorical sense as standing for a leader, a ruler, or a, a commander, some chief. It's also used in classical literature as a lawgiver. And of course you can see now when we move from the literal sense of flock of sheep to, to the metaphorical realm of humans and people, certain people, and shepherds, these people. Other people being sheep, now we're into a whole different dynamic. <laughs> Plato, in his Republic, reminds us of metaphorical use of the word when he compares the rulers of the great uh, re Greek city-states, republicans, states, and people who care for the flock. Now, there's a political use of shepherd where the shepherd is the uh, ruler, or one of the rulers, senators, so forth, of the democratic state, and republican states of Greece, where the human shepherd is a copy of the divine shepherd and lawgiver. In the ancient East, shepherds at the early date became a title of honor. It was applied to divinity of rulers alike. The custom was followed throughout antiquity its past, its terminology was emboldened throughout the Hellenistic world as well. Now, let's point that out to indicate that when we come into the Bible and we find the word shepherd used metaphorically, that it isn't something abrupt and new. It's not. It's something that was generally practiced metaphorically, concept of shepherding. It meant someone who was equipped to care for the people, the sheep. So that's the classic definition of shepherd, both from classical literature and and from sacred literature in the Old and New Testament. And I'll stop right here and talk about the President of the United States during this time. This is 2023. Is he a good shepherd or a bad shepherd? Are the people prospering or are they in hunger? Are people being taken to fields that are bare? Is he pulling up food and have a bunch of sheep just starving for food and for things, substance, things they need to prosper? Is he a good shepherd or a bad shepherd? Now let's look at the Old Testament C here. As we've already indicated, the literal sense is well established 
starting with Genesis 4-2, where Abel was the keeper of the sheep. But all through the Old Testament, you run into shepherds. Shepherds are very common in the Old Testament. So we don't have to labor too hard or labor the point too hard about this. There's a clear definition about a shepherd in the Old Testament. It's one who feeds and cares for sheep. But when we move into the metaphorical realm, we find that God himself has honored the word shepherd as well by taking it to himself and being described as the, the chief shepherd, described to that title, and people who depended on him, loved him. And the great old classic for that is Psalm 23.1. The Lord is my shepherd. Hallelujah. And we don't have problems here. I'll tell you why shortly. Now, going back into Genesis for other metaphorical references, let's uh, look at Jacob's blessing Joseph. And he says to him in his blessing prayer, the God in whose presence my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who shepherded me through life to this moment, bless thee, lads, bless them both, bless the lads, bless them, the grandsons. A lot of them. He's blessing them. And he wants to identify the God who wants to bless them with. And one of the epithets he applies to the God that he wants to bless his grandchildren with is the God who shepherded him from beginning to end throughout his life to that very moment. Now as a shepherd, a responsible for, for all his sheep is responsible for his sheep. Now Jacob, this is my witness now that I'm old. And I'm passing on my blessing to my grandchildren. This is my witness. The God has shepherded me throughout life to this point. How often do people lay their hands on their children or their grandchildren and bless them? How often do they speak about the shepherd who took care of them all their lives? Brought them in. Kept them in. Brought them through. To the end of their lives. The good shepherd. Not too many people do that that I know of. Western people don't do it much at all. Lay your hands on your kids. Lay your hands on your grandkids. Bless them. Love them. At the end of your days, pass on that blessing. Hallelujah. Now look at Genesis 49, 24. Now we read again of the mighty one of Jacob, the shepherd, the rock of Israel. Now, we sing this evening, He is my rock. We, we sing that all the time. All of these metaphors are designed to uh, give us the insight into some characteristic of God's activities in nature. And someone has said, what, who, what is this? that words to this effect, God has ransacked all of nature to find metaphors and illustrations and similes and pictures that he could show us he could li he liken himself and his characteristics, his nature and his will, so we'd more easily understand it. For instance, the Old Testament says that God's righteousness, his righteousness, his righteousness is like the mountain. When you look at an old rugged mountain, think of his righteousness. It's, um, it's immovable. His righteousness is like a mountain. It's not a mountain, but it's like a mountain. It gives you a picture. God's not a shepherd, but he is a shepherd. He's metaphorically, he cares for people that are referred to as his sheep. Psalm 74 and verse 1. O oh God, why hast thou cast me off forever? Why dost thy anger burn against the sheep of thy pasture? Now, the psalmist was amended to the fact that God seemed to have withdrawn from them. Uh, probably for good reason, sure. But he pleased God like a, a shepherd. Why has you cast us off? Why have you done that? Why does your anger burn against us? We're like sheep. We are your sheep of your pasture. Don't cast us off. Now, Psalm seventy-eight, fifty-two. 52. Speaking of the Exodus, God bringing three and four million Israels out of Egypt. But he moved out his people like sheep and guided them 
like a flock in the desert. Now, when God is speaking of the Exodus, of the bringing out of three or four million people of an elect nation out of Egypt, he speaks of them as sheep, taking them to the wilderness. He got them out like a shepherd, and they conduct them to the wilderness as his flock, like they're the sheep. He watched over them. He was responsible for them. And he cared for them. Then, of course, 79.13, the psalmist refers to us, we thy people, the flock of thy pastors. Psalm 80, in verse 1, O shepherd of Israel, give ear, I say, give ear, thou who leadest Joseph like a flock. Psalm 95.7, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock which he tends. Now, that's a very small selection. There's a lot more of just the references in the Old Testament as God being a shepherd. Now, I'm sure, I don't think any of us have any problem with God being our shepherd. We don't. <laughs> we don't. I don't. I've never had a problem with God being my shepherd. He's God. We look around and see the trees and the water and the oceans and the mountains and all the rest of creation. I have no problem with him shepherding me. Now, even in the Old Testament, we have come to a point where shepherding got into a problem. And it did. Now, that was the point where man, representing God, has, as under-shepherds to God, introduced the human element into the picture. Well, yeah. Now, I don't have a problem with God. I don't have a problem with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I do not have a problem with them being a shepherd. It's problems I have with you. You have problems with, if you're my shepherd, well, you may be a good man, but you're not God. Now, I'm likely to compare you with God, my shepherd, and, and there's no comparison. I was a shepherd, and am, and am a shepherd, appointed by God to be a shepherd. And when you're a young shepherd, you have a lot of problems. And he would tell me things, the Holy Spirit would, and it came with the anointing. It wasn't just a Mike hears from God. No, Mike heard things from God he didn't want to hear about his sheep, about God's sheep, and go take care of this and go do this and go do this. And I'd talk to him about it, and they would tell me, you don't know everything, but I knew that, whatever it was. Most of the time it wasn't good. God never sent me as a shepherd to bring one of the flock back into the kingdom, which they were doing great already. Now we're going to pull them over here. Very seldom do they need correction. Usually those people heard from the Lord themselves. They didn't need me. I would take care of his sheep that were, you, for better terms, I have no terms, but little black sheep. They were going everywhere, doing everything they shouldn't do. And God loved them. He loved them so much he sent me. And I told him, I'm not invited to any parties anymore. I'm not invited up to dinner. I'm not invited. They, people don't want me around most of the time. Because I knew what they did, which would get them into trouble. Most of the people that I ministered to, that I was given to help and to, to lead along, not to lord over, but to help them stay in, well, they were they pretty rough. They never knew the Lord from the beginning. They weren't church people. They had no idea about protocols, about the presence of God and the things of the holiness of God and entering into presence of praise and worship. And I, I would tell them many times when we go to church together, you get rid of your sin before you step through those doors. Whatever you have done that makes you unclean, get, ask the Lord to forgive you and wash you by his precious blood. Don't go into that tabernacle where we're going to meet in the presence of the Lord. And we always, always came in with the presence of God there. Always. I don't care who we were. For 30 years, a steady revival. It wasn't, let's go find a revival. Let's break it out over here. Let's break it out. Uh-uh. All we had to do was get together. The God, God very, he very, very richly anointed us and loved us and showed us the truth this way. Shepherding was a rough deal, a hard deal. I had no problem with God. I had a problem with people, even those that were shepherds in the body of Christ. I would watch and listen to, and it was not such, there wasn't a whole bunch of smarts coming out of it. it might have been a strong anointing, and you don't hurt God's anointed no matter what. Just get out of the way. Sometimes you needed to leave their presence. Just get out of the way. Because God had anointed them to be shepherds, pastors, 
shepherds. Well, anyway, there's a difference when man is, is being chosen as a shepherd. Now, it's a valid transition. God has chosen throughout history, all through the entirety of his word, to delegate his heavenly authority to men whom he chooses. He equips them to represent him in the earth, in, in a shepherding sense to, to be his mediators, his representatives, as under shepherds, under his authority, under his authority, under his authority. Now that's where the problem comes. When we go further into it, we'll find there are good shepherds and there are bad shepherds. There, there are both of them. Now God is the good shepherd. So that's that's already self-explained. He's never a bad shepherd. He's a good shepherd. The problem comes when we get in the transition from God to his agents. Uh, from God to his regents. From God to his under-shepherds. And we have a problem. Let's serve under God. Now, let's look at at this transition from God to man. Let's look at that for a minute. Psalm 77, 20. Psalm 77, 20. Thou hast led thy people as a flock. Now, I don't have a problem with it up to that point. We all don't. Thou hast led thy people as a flock. Oh, praise God. God's leading. He's my shepherd. Now, here's the problem starts. He has led his people as a flock by the hand of Moses. Oh, there we have a problem. I love Moses. Aaron. Now, how come they have to be in there? God is fine, but Moses and Aaron, whoa. People had problems with Moses. They rebelled against him. They disobeyed him, disliked him. They obeyed him and not. How many problems were there with Aaron? He made a gold calf when Moses was up the mountain. Worship demons. The problem is not God. It was with shepherds. Problems with shepherds that God delegated. Why and how? Moses couldn't even talk. They're only representatives of God to the degree that they express God's heart, his, his principles, his image. Here's another one. Second Samuel chapter 5 and verse 10. In time past, when Saul was king over... This is the Israelites is talking to David. But it's, it's, a, it's a great and interesting story. The men that are saying this stayed with Saul for nine years. Well, David was kicked around the country for a while. Now, wait for this diplomatic speech. But eventually, after Saul died, they do come to Saul at Hebron. Second Samuel 5, 2. I'm sorry, they come to David, not Saul. He's dead. In time past, when Saul was king over us, you, David, were the one who led Israel out and brought them in. The Lord also told you, you are the man who is to be the shepherd for my people, or Israel, and you shall be sovereign over Israel. Now, notice this. Saul had been their shepherd. He'd been their king. But he was a bad king, and he was a bad shepherd. And God anointed David king. David was to be Israel's shepherd before Saul ever died. Saul went on living for another nine years or so. Now some of the people went to, with David, but a lot of them stayed with Saul. David had about 400 to 600 people. But eventually when Saul died, the rest of the people did come and had a, a great reunion with Hebron. And at that time, we knew it all the time. They said, we knew it all the time. But where were they during that nine years? If they knew it all the time, why are they with Saul? I want you to notice something else. And I read this and loved it. If Moses was a shepherd and Aaron was a shepherd over Israel, Moses was a political man. He was a prophetic man, that's true. He was a lawgiver. But he was a shepherd. Now, could we see that a shepherd then is also not only one who cares for the sheep, but who exercises some 
a rule and authority. He's a ruler, authority. And this is where it starts to get sticky for some. They don't like it. They want God as a shepherd. They don't want to get involved in any kind of order where their lives may be relating to some other people's lives. Americans f foremost. And around the world, this happened from the very beginning as we read, but you get over to America. In America, everybody's a king and everybody's a queen. They just are. They're individualistic. They have been bred that way from the very beginning. Uh, socialism has tried to get a hold in this country so hard, but it's not socialism. It's not even progressive socialism, which is bad. It turns into a dictatorship. But the Church of Jesus Christ does not like to be submitted in that form to anybody. I'm submitted to my pastor. I don't even know what that means. You don't. Most of the time, in, in fairly large churches, you don't even have access to your pastor. They have some under shepherd that takes care of cell groups and takes care of smaller groups. And I'll be honest with you, they're they're pretty young, a lot of them, and they don't have a lot of common sense, and they're not raised up by the elders. They don't even get to see each other. They may have a meeting once a week and talk about the horrible things that may be happening, and we got to take care of this, take care of that. But I don't think that they have any wisdom that flies out of a lot of them. They just don't. And they definitely don't have wisdom from the Holy Spirit, and wisdom from the elders, which is to be passed down, where they should have an elders' meeting. And you can call them what you want, but they're still shepherding. And that's what it is. Now, we have a problem with that, especially, like I said, like in America. we got a problem with shepherding. We try to submit ourselves under a shepherding. We fall into a, a kind of a, a, a prophetic ministry of, of control where you're terrified to do anything unless the prophet says so. Uh, that's not real. I told people many times when I worked in the prophetic, I don't control you. If what I'm saying to you doesn't match what you're doing or what's going on with you, kick it out and go your way. God's not going to kill you. The devil may show up and mess with you, but God's not. He's the chief shepherd. Go to him and listen to him. There is some structure in this shepherding. Structure that needs to be played out properly. Now, how do we relate directly to God? We like that, but we don't like to direct to, to people. Jesus and me forever. But, but, but Jesus said someone else. It's a it's hard. Moses was referred to as a shepherd, and Moses ruled over over Israel. Three or four million people. Moses went up and got the law. Yeah, that was one of the earlier definitions of shepherd. He was a lawgiver. He got the law for Israel. He came back and told Israel how they were supposed to behave before the Lord, and that's what behave, period. He mediated God's law to Israel. Aaron, on the other hand, was God's choice as a uh, to teach Israel how to approach God. And, and he did a golden calf before all this. And he was told how to teach people about the tabernacle. They were in different spheres. They were shepherds nonetheless, but they were in different spheres. So was David. King David was responsible for shepherding the people, but he was also sovereign, was king over Israel. We won't get into the sovereignty of the king, but let's, that raises another question. That belongs to this initial stream of of subjects we're going to talk about. That's subject of authority. Oh, I don't mind God having authority, but not a man. Yeah, well, I came from a family of authority. My father was an authoritative man. <laughs> Believe me. And it's a delicate subject for some, but it wasn't for me. Knowing how to submit and bow your head was fairly easy. You know, it's, it's a scripture. Authority can be misused, though, so you got to watch yourself. Authority, when it's properly used, can be very authoritative in place of, of power. A set authority stops a sheep from falling over a cliff, and I did that many times, which sheep are, tend to do. Sheep are notorious for being real smart. They don't see well by nature. They're not as clever as goats, which sometimes bother me because uh, that metaphor in the Bible, which is, is disappointing sometimes, we're called sheep and the other people are called goats, and I don't like that too much. Let's look at Psalm 78. There's a great passage on delegated shepherding. Psalm 78, verse 70 to 72. 
he chose David, his servant, whom he took from the sheepfold. Isn't that interesting? That the two great shepherds of the Old Testament, that are actual shepherds, metaphorically, God's delegated shepherds, were also literally shepherds. Huh. God met Moses while he was tending his flocks, his father-in-law's flocks, the sheep. Met him at the burning bush on the desert and spoke to him. Sent him to deliver his people. He was shepherding his father's sheep, father-in-law's sheep. Now he was in the shepherd, his heavenly father's sheep. Hmm. Huh. David. Where did David come from? Well, when Samuel went down to Bethlehem and to anoint a king at the command of God, Saul, well, Saul was still alive, of course. He went down, and the man whose sons he was to consider the sons of Jesse. He looked at the seven sons of Jesse. One of them's a great big old fine strapping guy. He came down in a row. Each one was smaller and each one was a little less vigorous and strong looking and kingly. He thought, of course, the biggest one's these going to be it. The big, pretty one. No, Samuel, God said. That's not the king. So he went down the whole line and there was nobody left. He said, God, I've gone down all of them and you've never said nothing. Is there any more? Yes, the old man has got any more. You got another boy? So Samuel said to him, Father Jesse, you got another son? He said, Oh, yes, I do. He's out there in the sheep. He's composing choruses and singing unto God all the time. He's a peach fuzz on his face. He's just a kid. He's not interested in him. Samuel said, You don't know God. Go get him. And God is interested. And he was it. Now, he chose David, his servant, whom he took from the sheepfold. Where did he get him? From the sheepfold. And anointed him as king. So when Moses was inaugurated as the leader of Israel, the shepherd of Israel, under God, he already knew a lot about sheep, didn't he? And when David was made the king of Israel, illustrious, he knew a lot about sheep. So it's interesting that two of the leading men of the Old Testament were both men whose natural vocation was that of a shepherd. And if you if you read that, they move from the literal meaning of shepherd to a, into a, a place where they could actually use what they had learned. And if you read about David when he was being hunted by Saul, or when he worked with Saul, for Saul, he said that he did things wisely, and he was smart. He knew. He knew what people would do by watching sheep. He knew what sheep would do. People aren't too much off of that. So he was pretty smart. And he moved to invocations. Of the spiritual vocations, metaphorically, was referred to as, as that of a shepherd. That's both of them. But David, David his servant, who we took from the sheepfold, he brought from following ewes with their young, and to rule Jacob in Israel. Here's that rule again. The word, rule. Now, let's draw your attention to rule Jacob as people. And Israel, his heritage, and he shepherded the flock of God according to the integrity of his heart. And he guided them by the skill of the workings of his hands. Now let's let's draw your attention to Jeremiah chapter twenty three and verse one, Ezekiel verse thirty four and one. Simply to point this out to you that all the shepherds who profess to represent God, not Godlike. No, no, not all of them. And that's where our problem comes in. That's why in our next teaching I want to teach on this. We're dealing with the tactics and practice of shepherds. What are they supposed to be like? What's he supposed to do? What is he not supposed to do? What are the boundaries of a shepherd? What is the response of the sheep to a shepherd? What is the attitude of the sheep to sheep? And all of that is dealt with in the word. Jeremiah 23, 1. Listen to these ominous words. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. Woe. We all agree, I'm sure. And Moses was a good shepherd. He didn't scatter them. And we agree that David was a good shepherd. 
but when we think of some of the kings of Israel, well, and we see we see some of the prophets as Israel as well. They were bad kings and bad shepherds, and bad prophets. They didn't cut it. And just as God commended the good shepherd, he declared a woe on the evil shepherds, the bad ones. Ezekiel 34, 1. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds. Prophesy against the shepherds? Can God be against shepherds? Yes. Yes. Yes, he he can be against sheep as well. <laughs> I thought about this several times. And uh, the anger of the Lord. And uh, if you look it up and you do some research on it, you research the word anger, and you know that there's more in the Bible about God's anger than it's about his love. Hmm. We always talk about God loving us. Oh, God loves us, God loves us. But we never say much about God being cross at us, angry. But God's a normal parent, right? He will pat you and love you, and he will pat you. <laughs> he's capable of expressing real affection towards you. And he's all capable of expressing displeasure with you. If you have to recognize it. So when your shepherds aren't functioning right, he deals with them. That's one of the secrets that I'm anticipating to show people that's a secret that that you're relating to a shepherd or pastor and that is to understand that you have recourse to them shepherding you you can go to their boss it's kind of a sneaky legitimate thing that you can do if you feel that your shepherd is not behaving properly and not treating you right you can just slip around him and have a word with his boss and his boss will come down and spend a little time with him in his office. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Take care of business. Now, that's better than confronting your shepherd. It's better that you turn your cheek on him and just go to his boss. Well, I don't tell anybody I said that. But that's true. Now, you get the idea from the Old Testament. And kind of cheap, simple. Shepherding. A shepherd. And it's just this. Now, God chooses to to refer to himself as a shepherd as simple because he knows that we understand what a shepherd is and by that analogy we can appreciate what God is like as a good shepherd but he also lets us know that he's established in the earth in kings and princes and priests and judges and political figures and police, civil governments, as well as religious governments, he has established leaders and leadership. Listen to Romans 13.1. The powers that be are ordained of God. All power comes from God. All power. Now God ordains good government. God ordains good government in this civil realm as well. God ordains good government in the spiritual realm. That's what he ordains. And the governmental figures that God ordains speaks about them as being shepherds as well. They represent God in his care for his sheep, in his rule over his church and over his world of moral intelligence. A world without delegated authority from God is not a world, is not the world of the Bible at all. I'm tempted to deviate into a demonic mess that we see around us, but I'm not going to. Other than I want to say this, our problem today in the political realm and in the juridical realm, in the educational world as well, and in the economical world, it can be traced directly to the fact that man have abandoned their authority based on his God and his revealed word and start in the assumption in terms and sets of rules that are Vote on by the people. He never intended the king to reign on his own. He didn't. He never intended a politician to function independently of his government, of God's government. In fact, if you go back to the, the book of Deuteronomy, God outlines that king is supposed to be. What the king is supposed to do is, is to read the law constantly. Constantly have it at his side. Constantly put it in his mind. He governs as God's representatives out of God's revealed law, God's word, not his own. 
not the people's. Now, nothing changed. It doesn't change. Now, the fact that men have thrown it off and become, we're, we're above that, we're above that, the judiciary appeases the people, doesn't appease the law, do the law. The fact remains that God's hold judges responsible, policemen responsible, lawyers responsible. He, uh, he hates people that messes with weights and measures. He, uh, he hates people that mess with his government mess it up. These are political statements. For instance, the greatest political statement in the world is this. Jesus Christ is Lord. That's the greatest one. Jesus Christ is Word. He's Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. That's the greatest political statement in the world. If you understand Lord, Peter, speaking to Cornelius, said this, Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Lord, how much? All. Jesus Christ is Lord of all. All oh, kings, princes, judges, teachers, politicians, financiers, parents, pastors, evangelists, teachers. He's Lord over all. And he delegates the authority that he has to each one individually in their place. Once they cut that line of authority from where they are to God, they're no longer functioning under that valid authority. Now they're functioning out of authority that is not God's authority. It's anti-God and out of necessity has to deal with him. He can't permit rebellion. He just can't do that. And he will deal with it. Maybe slow for you. You may think it's slow, this judgment. But if you look through history, there are nations that have disappeared because they become so cut from God's word. Cannibalistic killers, sacrificers. Millions of people have disappeared. They're warlike. They don't follow God at all. They throw him off. They throw him off. The pal pa the, the <laughs> All the ancient people who were around Israel at the time, Philistines, the Philistines knew about God. They knew all about him. Your God does this, your God does that. But they <laughs> worshipped their own gods. But they knew all about God. And what he does and what he didn't do, they knew when the Lord was with them, and they knew when the Lord had left them. They tried to, in many ways, try to get God to leave them, because he knew if they destroyed their holiness, destroy that righteousness, that God would leave them. So, we see that authority is given by God to all these men, and they need to stay in the Word, the revealed Word, and His Spirit. David talked to the Lord. Saul talked to the Lord, and the Lord spoke back to both of them. Then when Saul had sinned against God, against man, he was a bad king, God left him. And God sent an evil spirit to torment him. God sent an evil spirit. God did these things. It's not haphazard. God didn't leave him, so it left a void, and the devil came. God knew exactly what he was doing. Exactly. That's the other side of the coin. Anyway, that's first of all, we have the literal sense of shepherding. And we touch on the literal sense of a shepherd and what it's supposed to be. We've got to keep in mind that the Bible constantly working from the literal facts of shepherding to the metaphorical fact of shepherding. is to be able to understand about shepherding. In New Zealand, they had 66 million sheep and six million people. You learn a lot about shepherding in New Zealand, in Australia, even here. And if you want to learn about shepherding, find one, find a book about shepherding. And it shows you rich about sheep and how to find out about sheep. There's lots of spiritual analogies in these books. So never keep out of your mind for long the fact that when we're talking about shepherding, it's a metaphor derived from the literal fact of, of a shepherd caring for a sheep. Very simple. Very simple. Let's look at that scripturally in the New Testament. At the time of the birth of our Lord Jesus, chapter 2 and verse 8, we read Matthew chapter 2 verse 8. There were in the same country shepherds staying in the fields and watching over the flock by night. Watching over the flock by night. What for? 
taking care of them. That's a beautiful designation of shepherd. Watching over the flock at night. Watching over the flock. Well, at night, too. The predators come. Whenever shepherds are dealt with, well, listen. The important thing to notice about the shepherd, ideally, is the emphasis placed on the shepherd caring for the sheep. He cared for the sheep. He didn't just fleece them. And the sheep need to respond to the shepherd. It's true. But that's not where the emphasis is placed. The emphasis I see was always placed on the shepherd looking over the sheep. Now, once in a while, you, I, and I've, I've heard this so many times, and it bothers me. When a, somebody says, a shepherd supposedly, says that they're uh, ones they're over, the people that they are under him. And I don't like that. It makes me edgy. Because he's now he's missing the emphasis of caring for the sheep. It's not the one that 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 uh, you're over, the one under me. The emphasis is on the wrong thing. It's on the sheep. The emphasis should be on the shepherd. The shepherd is one who cares for the sheep. So, in their language, you can pretty much see where they're at. Now, it, for a long time, you have to... Was no better than a sheep, and I was made to know that. But take care of the sheep, and that's what it came into my life, and what I was supposed to do, and did. It's not the fact that somebody's under me. My concern, what I have to answer to God for, was: Did I care for the sheep? And I have to take now. For for a, a moment, I'd like to to talk about this. I judge things a little bit differently than a lot of people would. They just give up on somebody. Well, they're just bad. No. And I know when the Lord has given me responsibility towards one of his sheep. And I have to be careful what I do and what I say. I just don't cut them off. You just don't go, hey, you're just bad. You better be careful what you do as a shepherd to care for his sheep. You're not there to just fleece them, cut all the hair off, get all the money, do all your thing, and control them. It would be nice sometimes to be able to control them, but you don't control people. You don't control them. You, you warn them and guide them as the Holy Spirit anoints. If you don't have anything for them, you can't give anything to them. So you need to know the Word, a tremendous amount of the Word, to be able to make those decisions. Give the Holy Spirit information inside you to pull up to, to give to these people at the right time for the right thing. To help them, to guide them, to lead them in the way. Not to hurt them, not to control them, and to say, these are my people. No, they're not your people. The church is not their people. The church is not your people. The church belongs to God, and you maybe have delegated authority, but you better be real careful with it, because that judgment comes, and it can be kind of rough on you. So, that does bother me when I do hear that. And it kinda, when a man says with a certain degree of uh, concern in his voice about the sheep I have the care of s several people now that here that's shepherd talking and then I hear somebody say I got about 10 men under me and I hear the voice of a a, uh, a marketing scheme <laughs> called Christianity for him but that's not authority that's something else <laughs> that's not right now justice in the Old Testament we have the literal sense uh, as the same in the new. So in the new, as we have in the old, it's metaphorical in the new. And interestingly enough, when it was in the old, all could be said of Jehovah in the Old Testament is now translated to Jesus in the New Testament. Because Jehovah of the old is the Jesus of the new. Well, all right. That's how I look at it. And that's how it's supposed to be. And that's what Jesus said in John 10:11 is recorded. I am the good shepherd. Now here again, notice this. Now, what comes from the ideal shepherd of defining his work? I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd boasts about all the people he rules? No, no, he doesn't. No, doesn't say that. Uh-uh. A good shepherd will give his life for the sheep for the sake of the sheep he'll give his life huh. 
That's what makes a good shepherd. Give his life. Now Jesus referred to him as the good shepherd. And he defines it. He defines it, what a good shepherd is. A good shepherd will give his life for the sheep. I think our Lord emphasizes this in one other passage where he said, What man of you had a hundred sheep and lose one? Will he not leave the ninety-nine and go get that one out in the wilderness, go after that one? Until he found it. Now, what do you hear of that? You're hearing care and concern. And you secure those 99 and go find that one. Well, on the average person, with just the average pastor would go, well, 99 out of 100 is not a bad average. And that's not what Jesus said. Jesus made it very lopsided here. How many of you had 100 sheep? You lose one. Will he not? Will he leave that 99 in the wilderness and go after the one? And, there other, and David left somebody to tend the sheep when he became anointed. In Hebrews 13.20, I think this is a magnificent passage too. It's a benediction at the end of the Hebrew letter. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that the, the great shepherd of the sheep, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, equip you thoroughly for the doing of his will, effecting in us that we in us which that is pleasing to his sins pleasing to him in his sight, through Jesus Christ. Not only good shepherd, but he's the great shepherd of the sheep. Now let's hate to add this too. Our Lord Jesus, along with the Jehovah of the Old Testament, is the shepherd that's unique shepherds par excellence because the Lord Jesus did for his sheep which you and I cannot do for our sheep at all he is excellence when it speaks about him laying down his life for the sheep he laid down his life in the manner that I could never lay down never he laid down his life substitutionally uh, he laid his down vicariously I can't do it I'm able to lay my life down Put it away for the sheep's sake, but it'll never have the effect that Jesus had. He is the master. Completeness. He is the good shepherd, the great shepherd. I'm an under shepherd. It's my place to be like him as much as I can, and that's a lifelong deal, but having the right attitude towards God's sheep, towards God's people, is a very, very important thing. How you look at things. How you look at things. I may down my life for you again, but I can't lay it down like him. I can't lay it down redemptively. I can only lay it down pastorally. I can't do it the other way. It's not there. I can't go the second mile. I'm going to lay my life down for your life in that way. Now, we're not necessarily here. We're talking about uh, taking care of the sheep and body for the sheep. We're talking laying down our life down for the for that purpose for years. You'll have to lay it down. The freedoms of life to care of the sheep. There's some, a lot of times, I will tell you, to care for the sheep and to have that anointing to go that way and listen to the Lord. You will lay down in this life things that you would not normally lay down. I know people who don't go bowling because the Lord said you're not going to go bowling anymore. They don't do their art anymore. They don't do their music anymore. They don't do those things that their soul loves. They like them and love them, but they're not supposed to do them. I don't know why. I don't know why. Or they're supposed to live in a certain city. And they won't move out of that city. And everybody hates them in that city. But they're living in that city because that's what they were supposed to do. They live a certain way. They do a certain thing because of the anointing and because they're called as shepherds to shepherd the, sh the flock of God. And there is that laying down your life for the sheep. Do you love me, Peter? I love you, Lord. Feed my sheep. Well, there's a distinct way that you're going to live in the Lord. That you have to lay down things in the Lord most people don't know. Only other shepherds that are of like faith with you and have lived that life as well. And, and you'll divinely see the times when you get so discouraged because you wish sanctification of the sheep would happen quicker. Well, it happens, but only when they hit about 65. 
Now, seventy age sanctifies people so quickly; they can't do anything anymore. Their minds not be too sanctified, but their bodies start to be, as it's dying and getting old. Can't do the things anymore that it used to to sin to get themselves in trouble, and usually for money or for pleasure, one way or another. You're a shepherd, sanctified. And it might be more pleasant to do all these things, but you're not going to because you lay them down. And you pick up that staff and you do what you're supposed to do. There's one more description of the Lord Jesus in the New Testament. First Peter 5, 4. When the chief shepherd shall appear, he shall receive a crown of glory that fades not away. The good shepherd, the great shepherd, and the chief shepherd. When he speaks of the chief shepherd, he talks about chief uh, in relation to other shepherds, right? Chief shepherd. He's over the shepherds. Every shepherd on earth, whether he's a political shepherd or a spiritual shepherd or uh, economic shepherd, educational shepherd, or again, like I said, a spiritual shepherd, a Christian shepherd, every shepherd on earth is subject to a chief shepherd. He's an extension of the shepherd in, in the heart of God. Let's, let's do that again. I'm, a, I'm not a shepherd. I'm an apostle. Well, no, nah, that's not... Uh, you're a shepherd first. Every ruler, every type of ruler, there is a specific shepherd. I shall talk about it later, but, but every person that's responsibility to care for people in general, I can suppose that a father's shepherd and a mother, a mother's shepherd as well. Yeah. Anybody who has responsible and responsibility for people should be a reflection of the heart of God. So for a man to say, I'm an evangelist, but I don't care much for people. Well, that's silly. Every, every person that cares for people. Now you can tell the difference between a a good man uh, in a political life and a bad man. A good man is concerned for his constituencies. He's concerned for them. A bad man is concerned for himself and uses the constituencies. He lines his own pockets for the sake of his constituency. So in the New Testament, the Lord Jesus becomes the, the shepherd, the good shepherd, and the great shepherd, the sheep, chief shepherd, all of them. Now comes the problem again. Again, as in the Old Testament, we have it in the New. One cannot read the list of Old Testament kings without uh, a chagrin and laments the fact that there were bad ones and rejoices and there were good ones, but still, there were bad ones. Now, when there were good ones, the people prospered. When there were bad ones, the people endured hardship and suffered and death came. If you go to another metaphor in the Old Testament, and the Old Testament says, like priests, like people. You go into a church that you know the pastor and you know his ways, you know the people. Because the people, they take character and take on the spirit of that pastor. So, I have no problem with Jesus, but... <laughs> mm -hmm. My problems with... with uh, John Johnson, whatever. Well, why do you put him in the same sentence? Well, because Jesus is my shepherd. And Charles is the shepherd that Jesus has delegated to be the under-shepherd in my life. I don't have a problem with Jesus. He's perfect. I have a few problems with John Johnson because uh, I've shepherded and people have had problems with me because we're moved from God to man, which me, I'm thinking of me, from Jesus to me or your pastor, that's a move. That's a distinct move difference. And that's where the many of the problems come in right there. The answer is this. is not to wipe out the pastors. You don't wipe them out. You shouldn't wipe them out. God gave you pastors and teachers and evangelists. The answer is to find out for pastors, you need to find out what you're supposed to be. Sheep, find out what you're supposed to do either and be. Pastors, 
You're supposed to find out how you're supposed to relate to sheep. Sheep, you got to find out how to relate to pastors. So the purpose of of getting built up, like the word says, God gave you these people to build up His church, evangelists, apostles, teachers, pastors. God didn't create pastors to make life miserable for people. He did not do that. And sometimes it seemed like that. It seemed like that to me at times that that I came into people's lives just to make them. God just sent me into their lives to make them miserable chase them down, stop them from doing the things they really love, which was horrible sin most of the time. And I won't lie to you. I was given one of those ministries. It's not like I was given a bunch of wonderful, righteous people that paid their tithe and did their dues and did what they were supposed to do in the church and out of the church, and they were submitted to one another. And they were the kingdom of God on the earth, and everybody loved them and wanted to be like them. A lot of times when people were in my life and I was around them, they were heathens. They were worse than the heathens. And we live in a rough time. Right now we live in a time that's just incredibly strange. We have a a young man and he's, whatever, 25 years old, decides he's going to be a woman. I'm a woman today. You are. And the law says it's okay. Yeah, he can be a woman. You can identify as whatever. I don't, <laughs> I was, I just am befuddled by looking at it. And you can't, you can't preach it. People stop preaching sin. You're a sinner. No, they start preaching psychological problems, and we'll deal with it with pharmacopoeia. We'll give you some drugs and tone you down one way here, or tone you down one way here. It's sin. Now, if you repent of your sin, God will meet you there and heal you. He does that. He does that. But if you keep on sinning, well, the Holy Spirit will talk to you. You can't keep doing this. And this is not what you're supposed to do. And that's not this, and that's not that. Find out your relationship with God. Find out your relationship with Jesus. Find out your relationship with pastors. And sheep, find out your relationship with yourselves. The pastor. The pastor. Anyway. He gave gifts to men. Now... There are much to say about this, but he gave gifts to men, remember? The elders, the overseers, and the shepherd. They're all the same person. They just are the same person. Each one indicating a different aspect of that man, but still, he's a shepherd. That's the gift. Elder referred to the person. He's an elder. He's not a novice. Elder. I'm quickly getting into this. A young elder is... This kind of doesn't say it right, does it? Young elder. <laughs> they have a rough way to go. He's an elder. He's not young, is he? That doesn't mean in years. That means in, in service and experience, he's not young. He may be young in age, but it's not good to get into that right here. But the, it's hard for people to submit to them because he doesn't have the, he's too young. Now, many of our activity in recent years has not been blessed because the elders have been youngers. And they could do much of what they're doing without being called elders when they're youngers. It's hard enough being an elder when you're older. But to try to be an elder when you're younger is, ooh, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard. Nobody respects you much for that. It's a difficult thing. Now, notice he uses another word in connection with shepherd feed the flock of God. Pointy, Greek word. Pointy, to feed the pastor or shepherd the church of God, which you purchased with his own blood. And he's telling you what to do. Delegated authority. We're talking about shepherding. I'm going to finish it up. And we're talking about shepherding, strictly and only shepherding. We move from that great general category of all leaders that are over people are shepherds. I'm going to move from there over here. Now, God is a shepherd according to his word. Jesus is a shepherd. Moses is a shepherd. Aaron was a shepherd. King David was a shepherd. Civil governments were shepherds. Teachers were shepherds. Police officers were shepherds. There are all kinds of shepherds. Now we're coming to a specific group of people who are people in a local church who are gifts from Jesus Christ. Yep, yep. Now, let's just drop this in your heart to think about for a minute. 
He's an apostle. Oh, he's, a, he's an apostle. He's something. He's somebody. Oh, an apostle of God. Oh, like Paul on the road to Damascus, huh? An apostle. Oh, he's an apostle. Now we say this about the apostle. I'm going to go on to the evangelist in a second. That man was scarred from head to the to, top of his head to the bottom of his toes. Before his life was done, he, there wasn't anything on him but his fresh skin. He'd been beat, stoned, to death, shipwrecked. I don't know how many, he probably didn't put down as many times as he'd been harassed and tortured and slapped and punched and beat and turned the other cheek. And other times the Lord through him would just kill and destroy and, and love and help and do what he could. But that, that's an apostle. You want to be an apostle? Well, there's great responsibility that comes with an apostle and there's a whole lot of danger that comes with an apostle before you say that, a shepherd, an apostle. Well, an evangelist, he's a shepherd. Uh, uh, somehow, shepherds is a demeaning thing in the New Testament. It's demeaned. It, you get the impression if a man is a shepherd, well, he really doesn't matter whether God had much to do with it or not. He's just a shepherd, as long as he takes care of the people that he shepherds. And that's not true. Let me tell you something. When Jesus ascended on high, he gave gifts to men. He gave gifts. He gave gifts to men. Some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Now he gave pastor teachers the same way as he gave same kind of sovereign choice and same kind of equipment for their office. They did it apostles and prophets and evangelists. It's a different anointing, but it's the same. They're pastors and they're prophets, evangelists, but overall they're pastors. Every Tom, Dick, and Harry doesn't qualify to be a pastor at all. A pastor is a supernatural called and equipped to look after people. The flock of God. Well, let's, let's ease your mind a little on this. I love people and I like to help looking after them. I love them, but I don't know if I'm a pastor. Good for you. That's smart. I'd rather you be on that side of the fence than on the other and trying to fight to be a pastor, which you're not. I want to tell you this. There is such a thing, the first time I've seen it, in the Old Testament, Jesse called David. David, I want you to take some food down to your brothers here in the army, down there where the battle's at. And so he packed up the donkeys and got his food together and took off to visit his brothers. But the Bible said before David left, he left his sheep with his helpers in charge, somebody else is to help him with that. Now I believe that that every every shepherd and every apostle, every evangelist, every pastor, teacher, all of them, they come up with some point out of the flock. Somebody comes a helper. They're supposed to have helpers, and they help. Somebody has already proven their ministry out. He comes up. He comes up to help them. Now, he may be a very good helper, but I have had that happen to me, where I proved out my ministry and God has sent man to help me. And somehow, I don't, he could go the other way. Somehow things started the spirit nicely, and they end in the flesh. I don't know how many times men have come to help, and women have stopped them. Women have threatened them. Because they wanted to be the rulers of that household. And they, they stopped it. They stopped God. They stopped the anointing of God. They stopped the flow of God in their lives. I never followed through with any of them. I don't know. I know what they were called to do. But I know that they didn't finish it. They didn't do it. They had a lot of wonderful starts. But it ended. The devil came in and used people hard. Because their mind was not made up. The shepherding of God's people and choices you have to make and things you have to know. Well, I'll finish this. We won't finish this, really. The next two or three lessons will be about shepherds and shepherding because this is a hard subject in the body of Christ and it's coming up. There'll be millions coming to the body shortly. Millions, millions and millions. Revivals breaking out all over the land already. Millions will be coming into the body of Christ. They need to know the basics. And shepherding is one of them, which they don't, people don't like that word, but it's there. 
And I know great men of God that are submitted to other great men of God and to each other all over the world, which needs to be. And we thank you. Father, we ask you to give people understanding about this word today. And, of course, it stirs people up. We help them in Jesus' name to hear your voice, to understand your word. I thank you. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Hey, this is Mike. I'll see you next time. And Jesus is Lord. <laughs>